So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by uh, thanking the organizers for having me here today. Um, as a member of the ASM, it's an honor to be invited to this meeting. I work at the AIDS Research Institute, um, a center that is based in one of the major university hospitals in Barcelona. So let me start by reminding you that the first antiretroviral drug, ACT, was made available in 1987, only four years after HIV was discovered. But it was not until 1996 that three drug combination therapies completely changed the life expectancy of HIV infected patients in developed countries. New antiretroviral regimens, however, are not curative, resulting in an accumulation of the number of individuals living with HIV. In fact, antiretroviral regimens have to be continued for life as any attempt to stop them results in almost immediate viral rebound in nearly all the patients. This highlights, with no doubt, the relevance of viral persistence and reservoirs during antiretroviral therapy. As any other virus, HIV has developed persistence strategies. These strategies are based in three axes. One is based on the extremely high level of viral replication, resulting in high genetic diversity and the generation of escaped mutants. The second on your right hand side is the integration of the viral genome in the whole genome, facilitating viral latency and subsequent reactivation when receiving the appropriate stimuli. And finally, a persistent immune dysfunction results in sustained levels of inflammation and immune activation. The use of antiretroviral therapy has proved to be highly effective at preventing HIV replication, moderately effective in reversing immune dysfunction, and mostly ineffective at clearing cells harboring latent HIV. Therefore, the major barrier in developing a cure will almost certainly prove to be HIV latency. There are different approaches <coughs> to achieve either HIV eradication or a functional cure, including treatment optimization and intensification, reversal of HIV latency, therapeutic vaccination, immune-based therapies, and cell and gene therapy. And you will hear more about those strategies from the other speakers in this session. However, some of these approaches assume that all HIV replication is completely inhibited. And the antiretroviral therapy is so effective that it will inhibit any virus emergence, especially in the context of latency reversing therapies. It is hence critically important to determine the degree to which HIV replication persists during antiretroviral therapy. The rest of my presentation will be mostly based in the open access review that along with the Steve Dix we published a couple of weeks ago in current opinion in HIV and AIDS. Let me start by telling you that although there are multiple approaches to measure the reservoir in HIV in plasma, cells and tissues, none is able to directly determine if the virus is actively replicating. In the absence of antiretroviral therapy, the standard way to estimate the total body rate of HIV replication is determined by the plasma HIV RNA level. And at the study state, the level of viremia is a reasonable estimate of the number of virus producing cells and presumably the level of replication ranging from high viremia to a selected number of patients that are able to spontaneously control their viral replication in, answers of, in, in absence of treatment, the so-called HIV controllers and elite controllers. Current antiretroviral regimens quickly and persistently reduce plasma viremia below the limit of detection of standard techniques which is about 20 to 50 copies of viral RNA of plasma depending on the commercial assay. However, it is unclear whether plasma viremia during antiretroviral therapy is adequate to measure the extent to which potential infectious virus remain in other sites, such as lymphoid tissues, for instance. In patients on suppressive antiretroviral therapy, the clinical-based standard techniques to quantify plasma viremia only occasionally show presence of viral RNA above the threshold of 50 copies per ml. However, more sensitive techniques consistently demonstrate low-level viral persistence over long periods of time. The problem is that the molecular nature of these techniques 
cannot provide information in the infectivity of residual virus. Therefore, it is unclear if active replication contributes to viremia during antiretroviral therapy. Some of this debate is because of the uh, lack of consensus regarding the term replication. We can imagine two possible scenarios that they have to emphasize they do not have to be mutually exclusive. One could consider multiple cycles of residual viral replication, the so-called ongoing viral replication, or just the persistent release of virus by infected cells without productively infecting new cells. However, quantification of plasma viremia is unable to, to differentiate both situations. Sorry. An alternative way to explore whether there is residual replication is the intensification of antiretroviral therapy, which is especially informative if using integrase inhibitors. To understand this point, I would like to remind you that the HIV replication cycle involves reverse transcription and translocation to the new cDNA into the cell nucleus, where it integrates into the whole genome. This process is not always 100% efficiency, and in some cases it results in episomal forms of HIV DNA, some mainly long terminal repeat circles, rather than integration. The use of integrase inhibitors will block the intensification and the integration step, increasing the number of episomal HIV DNA forms in the cell. In this way, we can quantify two LTR circles as a surrogate marker of new infection events in presence of treatment intensification with integrase inhibitors. In order to prove that, we, we intensify with raltegravir, which was the first integrase uh, uh, inhibitor commercially available, an already suppressive three-drug antiretroviral treatment in 45 subjects, and compare them with a control group that remained with a triple-drug regimen for one year. Treatment intensification with integrase inhibitors transiently increased 2LTR circles in PBMCs, suggesting that raltegravir was abrogating new infections events in people who had otherwise undetectable viremia. This transient increase in two LTRs, sorry about that. This transient increase in two LTRs was subsequently confirmed by Hiruyo Hetano and UCSF, suggesting that persistence of low-level replication in at least some of the patients on antiretroviral therapy. However, it is important to stress that treatment intensification did not contribute to reduce the total number of latently infected cells in these studies. It has been debatable whether transiently produced two LTR circles are the result of ongoing cycles of viral replication or just persistent viral release from productively infected cells. However, mathematical modeling of the data by Ryan Tharakosti's group in University of Delaware suggests that the transient dynamics of two LTR after intensification with integrase inhibitors would be more compatible with ongoing viral replication seen as the blue line in the upper panel fitting the real data in the study in red diamonds, rather than just viral leakage from productively infected cells in the red line. Viral genetic analysis to episomal 2LTR circles compared to integrated HIV DNA in the whole genome suggests that viral replication was most likely supported by cells resident in tissues rather than circulating T cells. Subsequent spatial modeling suggests that conditions for the formation of an observed transient peak of 2LTR following raltegravir intensification include a sanctuary site diameter larger than 0.2 millimeters. I previously said that HIV infection increases immune activation and inflammation. However, antiretroviral therapy does not seem to reverse these parameters, and, do, and we do not know the link between active replication and immune activation. So in this regard, we look into different immune activation parameters in CD8 T cells in our in treatment intensification study. And as an example, you can follow here the evolution of the percentage of activation on memory CD8 T cells. This cell population was significantly reduced during the study period 
either by comparing baseline with week 48 or when using linear mix models over time. However, we saw no changes in the control group. When directly compare the slopes of both farms, controls versus intensification group, the difference was statistically significant. And similar data was obtained for alternative cell populations. In fact, when integrase inhibitor intensification was discontinued, CD80 cells activation level went up in patients who had shown increases in two LTR circles. The exploration of candidate molecules targeting viral reactivation has promoted the use of cell-associated HIV RNA as a way to measure the pharmacological impact of those molecules to flush HIV out of the whole genome. Here you can see that even before in vivo administration of forinostat at an HDAC inhibitor that has been used to reactivate the latent reservoir, the level of HIV transcription were greater than expected even in resting memory CD40 cells, which were considered to be transcriptionally silent. However, viral transcription does not necessarily imply generation of mature infectious variants. While studying in our group the in vivo impact of interferon, alpha, and also lithium carbonate to reactivate the latent reservoir, we came across the observation that rather than increasing cell-associated HIV RNA, they further mediated short-term suppression of viral expression, indicating even greater levels of viral RNA expression at treatment uh, baseline. In fact, higher levels of HIV expression while on antiretroviral therapy were, have been associated with shorter time to HIV rebound after treatment interruption, suggesting that the quantification of the active HIV reservoir may provide a biomarker of efficacy for therapies that aim to achieve antiretroviral 3 HIV remission. Alexander Pasternak from AMC in Amsterdam also found that higher cellular levels of HIV unspliced RNA in PBMCs from patients on antiretroviral therapy with undetectable plasma viremia significantly predict, predict subsequent treatment failure in these patients. And antiretroviral intensification with integrase inhibitors has been shown by Stephen, Steve Jukol and Joe Wan in US, UCSF to reduce the detection of unsplice HIV RNA in CD40 cells in the terminal ileum when compared with blood or other gut sites, suggesting that ileum might support ongoing productive infection in some patients on antiretroviral therapy, even if the contribution to plasma RNA is not discernible. But looking into multiple body tissues is invasive. For this reason, the development of new technologies should facilitate the detection of viral dynamics and localization in anatomical compartments. A new real-time in vivo viral imaging method to, to capture total body SIV replication using antibody-targeted positron emission tomography, called immune PET, has been applied to the detection of and localization of sites of SIV infection in macaques treated with uh, antiretroviral therapy. As seen in this image, SAB was still found in colon, select lymph nodes, small bowel, nasal tur turbinate, the genital tract, and the lung. Upon additional refinement to improve contrast and tracker uptake, this approach should be easily translatable to humans because of the availability of HIV antibodies and because the imaging approach in which is based this technology is already in use in the clinic. This also provides the ability to identify novel areas of viral replication that otherwise may be difficult to sample during studies in investigating the eradication of HIV. If HIV is replicating during antiretroviral therapy, then it's reasonable to assume that the virus would continue to evolve. Actually, HIV continues to replicate and evolve in any patient without antiretroviral therapy. Even among individuals with natural control of HIV infection, those uh, HIV controllers and elite controllers, virus evolution can still readily be detected. However, detecting HIV evolution during antiretroviral therapy has been difficult 
as shown in many different studies. Moreover, the analysis of rebounding viruses in subjects stopping antiretroviral therapy indicates that they, they, react, they reactivate from archival pre-existing virus without further detectable evolution. On the other hand, they have been described a few evidences of HIV evolution during antiretroviral therapy. Sequence evolution, including drug-resistant mutations and novel amino acid changes within a relevant HLA-restricted allele, have been described during recombinant HIV pox virus, pox virus immunization in patients with clinically undetectable viral load during suppressive antiretroviral therapy. Deep sequencing studies have detected genetic diversification in the envelope gene in HIV in patients infected <coughs> with exfortropic viruses. And finally, mathematical modeling has tried to better understand the coexistence of low-level viremia, emergence of intermittent viral bleeds, and the stability of a latent reservoir. A recent intensive study of three HIV-infected adults provides additional evidence of residual evolution and by extension probably replication during antiretroviral therapy. Deep sequencing methods were applied to HIV DNA obtained from lymph nodes at baseline month three and month six. And although drug resistant mutations did not accumulate in these patients, a phylogenetic analysis revealed a temporal structure consistent with ongoing viral replication. Which are the mechanisms that potentially enable HIV replication during antiretroviral therapy? It has been proposed that cell-to-cell -cell spread of HIV contributes to ongoing replication despite antiretroviral therapy. In an in vitro experimental model, infections involving cell-to-cell -cell spread were markedly less sensitive to antiretroviral drugs than infections originating from cell-free virus without requiring drug-resistant mutations. Cell-to-cell -cell transfer has also been reported to contribute to HIV infection and persistence in astrocytes, suggesting that decreased drug sensitivity in these contexts may contribute to provide additional explanations for HIV persistence in the CNS, where the access of antiretroviral drugs may be limited. It remains to be proved, however, whether cell-to-cell -cell spread has the same properties in vivo than in vitro. The distribution of antiretroviral drugs within lymph Tissues, lymphoid tissues may also be a factor. In a recent study, concentrations of several of the most frequent use antiretroviral drugs use, including tenofovir, entricitabine, efavirenz, atazanavir, and adrunavir, in lymph node, <coughs> in lymph node ileal and rectal mononuclear cells, were in fact lower than in peripheral blood. These lower concentrations correlated with a slower decay in the follicular dendritic cell network pool of virions and with detection of viral RNA in productively infected cells. In fact, the B-cell follicle within lymph nodes appeared to be a major site for active viral replication in untreated SIV and HIV infection. This is particularly true in the context of a strong host-mediated immune control and perhaps during antiretroviral therapy. CD80 cells, the best characterized pathway which is by which the, system, the immune system can actively control HIV and SIV, are excluded from the B follicles, presumably to allow more efficient interactions between B cells and those cells which enable them to mature, including T follicular helper cells. As in this way, the combination of limited drug penetration and lack of CTL responses in these regions may allow SIV and HIV replication in lymphoid tissue, accounting for the low level of viral evolution which has recently been observed in these sites. I will end it up by discussing a few clinical implications of residual viral replication during antiretroviral therapy. First, residual HIV replication has been linked with development of blips and low-level viremias between 50 and 1,000 HIV RNA copies per ml. Anecdotally, a replication-competent residual HIV has been isolated from plasma of a patient receiving long-term suppressive antiretroviral therapy. And finally, viremia above 2.5 copies per ml has been associated with greater LPS in plasma, lipopolysaccharide in plasma, a biomarker for bacterial translocation in gut associated with HIV infection and pathogenesis. 
There likely exists a complex bidirectional association between residual inflammation and residual HIV replication. Residual inflammation may contribute to HIV persistence by inducing the novel infection in activated CD40 cells and by upregulating the expression of immune checkpoint blockers and other immune regulatory pathways that limit HIV-specific immune responses. Persistent HIV replication may, in turn, contribute to an inflammatory environment. Therefore, it has been proposed that compounds addressed to reduce immune activation and inflammation may contribute to limit residual viremia and reservoir replenishment. But most importantly, and as I frequently stated by my colleague Steve Dix, we cannot cure HIV people by only getting rid of the low-level viral replication. But if we want to cure people, we have to get rid of it. The evidence of persistent replication in many, if not all, HIV-infected individuals on antiretroviral therapy argues for the development and evaluation of novel therapeutic strategies that will fully suppress viral replication. Among others, development of new drug, drugs, including improved drugs on existing targets, new drugs formulations or delivery systems, new, new viral and cell targets, new treatments based on neutralizing antibodies or synthetic antibodies will all be important to achieve greater potency, tissue penetrations, and tolerability. Let me wrap up my presentation by reminding you that although antiretroviral therapy is highly effective in inhibiting HIV replication, it is not curative. The degree to which HIV replicates during antiretroviral therapy remains clearly controversial. Limited drug penetration with tish within tissues and the presence of immune sanctuaries have been argued as potential mechanism allowing HIV to spread during antiretroviral therapy. As persistent HIV replication could have clinical consequences and might limit the efficacy of curative interventions, determining if HIV replicates during antiretroviral therapy and why should remain a key focus on the HIV research community. Before closing, I would like to uh, thank all the patients taking part in the clinical studies I just mentioned, and would also like to thank all my collaborators in different projects in this topic, especially my team who does the real day-to-day -day work. They are a fantastic, actually, group of smart and enthusiastic young people. And finally, may I acknowledge to the different sponsors and support that support our activities and people, and of course, thank you all for the attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>